as you can tell by the title of this podcast, it is going to be on John Scott, the short-lived president of Long Island. Now, it's important to note right away that other than his time in New England or on Long Island, the primary source for his life back in England and his life after leaving Long Island for the final time is himself. It's John Scott. The barest outline can be confirmed, but the details, again, we are to be reliant on the man himself. And I will be giving you his account, contrasting views, and I'm warning you, question everything. John Scott is a scallywag. And so I'm going to launch into the story. Take it in as you wish, become a believer, and any cause for doubt will be revealed in time. According to John Scott, his father, Colonel John Scott, is of the Scott family of Kent, England. And despite the name, they are not Scottish. During the English Civil War, Scott was a young boy, and his father, the Colonel, was a staunch royalist and a squire who pledged his entire estate to the king's cause, to the defeat of the parliamentarians. But if you listen to previous episodes of this podcast, you know that King Charles I lost the Civil War and his own head. Colonel Scott likewise lost his own estate, all of his wealth and prestige, died and left his family defenseless and destitute. At which point, the anti-royalist roundheads sold young John Scott into indentured servitude, destined for the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Quite an enthralling origin story. Now, his detractors claim it's far more likely he was scooped up from the low-class rabble of the streets of London, and his indentured servitude was more a symptom of the pre-existing poverty of his family and not in service of the king. It's notable that his connection to the Scott family of Kent is questionable and tenuous at best. But moving on to more certain facts, John Scott was sold at the age of 11 to a man named Emmanuel Downing. The sale of child indentured servants to Massachusetts came with a small fee that would help fund the new school known as Harvard in New England. John Scott's head bought a book or two. Downing lived in Salem, and he sold John to his neighbor, Lawrence Southwick. Scott's contract indicated that John would be taught to read, John would be taught a trade, and ultimately be freed when he reached adulthood. By his own account, and again, be weary of this, once he learned how to read, he became obsessed with accounts written by explorers and voyagers. Men like John Smith and Sir Francis Drake he wrote that he had the dream of mapping all the places in the world and identifying all the different people and their nations. It is certain that he was a, a restless child. He was brought before the court once for cursing, and he may have run away from his master at least once. Lillian T. Maurer, who wrote a book-length biography of John Scott, perhaps the only, wrote, At heart, he remained a royalist, while around him were roundheads who had fought his king killed his father, and sold him into bondage. Indeed, if John Scott's account is even partially true, this situation for a hormone-driven adolescent boy must have been intolerable. The Puritans of New England were allied, of course, with the Puritans of Old England, and they fell on the side of the parliamentarian forces. Not only had they taken everything from him and his family, but in servitude they are still taking. As he watched the days of his life, tick away reading accounts of faraway adventures. Yes, if this portrait is true, John Scott becomes quite a sympathetic character. And of course, things only get worse from here. The Southwicks, Scott's masters, they convert to Quakerism in the middle of Puritan Massachusetts, again residing in the village of Salem, which will later be known for their witch trials. The Southwicks are branded as heretics. They're repeatedly fined and whipped for their beliefs. The Southwick children were sentenced to be sold as indentured servants to the West Indies. But no captain in good conscience would ship them there. John Scott could perhaps relate to their condition, but as an indentured servant to the family, he could do little about it and suffered alongside them. Because although he never converted to Quakerism, the Southwicks lost the family business and were driven into poverty. In December of 1647, the court records show that Lawrence Southwick went to the Salem court to get permission to sell John Scott. The court allowed this for an indentured servitude contract of a three-year term. 
as Scott would be ending his adolescence in three years or so. We know at this point most certainly John Scott did run away, and probably worked on a ship's crew somewhere, but he was recaptured in May of 1648. And so he was on the lam for a good four or five months. Upon his recapture, his indentured servitude to the Southwicks was extended through the year 1652. During this time, it appears he learned the local Algonquin or Algonquian dialects. This will prove useful to him later. What wouldn't be useful to him would be the Southwicks. When his servitude was finally over, it was custom for a parting English servant to receive some sort of compensation for the human life they had expended on their owning family. The Southwicks had nothing to give him, in effect of having converted in a Puritan colony, nor did they ever really train him in a trade. John Scott only had the experience he gained at sea during those four or five months, sailing, fishing, privateering, whatever he did during that time period. He also had experience in the militia. Of course, all men 16 to 60 had to serve in the colonial militia. That included indentured servants. So he had a very small amount of military experience. And so after his servitude, he found himself back at sea, and he would work in various capacities in the Caribbean. According to his own account, wink wink, that would include Barbados and the Bahamas, Tortuga. His account, of course, portraying himself as a self-made man, starting with a dollar and a dream, to becoming a successful swashbuckling privateer in the Caribbean. I dare say a pirate of the Caribbean. Until finally settling down on Long Island. Now at this time, the natives, of course, lived on their ancestral lands on the island, but the English had settlements on the far eastern end, and then the Dutch had settlements on the far western end, and both colonial powers claimed the entire island. John Scott found himself, of course, on the eastern end, among these little settlements like Southhold that were only marginally part of a mainland Puritan colony like New Haven, and for the most part enjoyed a large amount of autonomy. And once there, John Scott discovered people he knew already, or at least people from similar backgrounds or similar communities. A lot of castaways from Salem, and a Quaker community that he had some familiarity with, having been owned by a Quaker, which seems like a contradiction if you know the Quaker beliefs. And yes, Long Island even harbored some former roundheads. John Scott had found his people. Among the earliest records of him on the island, his occupation is listed simply as Smith. And from this humble origin, he began to build himself up. During the First Anglo-Dutch War, the English on Long Island would raid the Dutch towns. The young John Scott, probably around 22 at the time, participated in these raids and made a little bit of a name for himself. He was arrested and held for a short time by the Dutch in New Amsterdam, probably returning to a hero's welcome and embellishing the tale of his captivity. By 1657, he became a practicing lawyer and eventually the tax commissioner for Southampton. He marries a woman named Deborah, starts a family, and before the end of the 1650s, is quite a respectable gentleman in the community. Now here's where his earlier servitude pays off. Remember, he learned how to speak some of the local Algonquian languages. Now the Montauk nation of Long Island would speak a language of a slightly different dialect than John Scott would have learned in Massachusetts, but they were close, and given enough time, he would adjust. And he became quick friends with Chief Wyandanche of the Montauk, an ally of the English, and no friend of the Dutch after Keith's war ten years before. John Scott's friendship with Wyandotch opened up more opportunities for the English settlers to buy land from these natives, specifically through John Scott. And when Wyandotch dies in 1659, his widow became Squaw Sachem, the female chief of the tribe, and continued these sales clear into the 1660s. And with this, John Scott came to own massive tracts of land on Long Island and brokered many early land sales that fill the records of early Long Island. All these new settlers and landowners being dependent on John Scott's deeds being valid. But now we have to pause because we know that John Scott can be manipulative and we know that Native American tribes have been cheated out of their land in what would seem like legitimate purchases. Now, was John Scott really friends with these tribal leaders? Was this true friendship or was this manipulation? Or was this lies and threats? The exact nature of how he extracted so much land from the natives is in question. And I don't really have an answer for that. I do have one little quote here from John Scott's own works 
He mentions that Christians, other than himself in relation to the natives and their land, were wresting away their country by force, where God and nature had given them a propriety. And so like Roger Williams, he had a opinion rare in the day that the Native Americans had rights to their land, whether or not they had improvements upon it, whether or not they farmed on it, or whether or not the King of England agrees to it. He also wrote that he considered the Native Americans to be one of the lost tribes of Israel. This is a more common belief at the time than his first contention, as the Bible does set out a genealogy from Adam and then all the way down to Noah, and then scattering from there to the ancestors of all the known people of the world that were then known to the biblical writers. However, the Native Americans aren't in the Bible, of course. One common explanation at the time is that they were descendant from one of the lost tribes of Israel, and thus reconciling the written religion with the reality. And by taking this view, people like John Scott and others, the Native Americans wouldn't just be this castaway heathen race. They would have a place in the Judeo-Christian worldview. A subtle difference, but one that could be important. Circling back around, by hook or by crook, by 1659-1660, John Scott's in the running for the most prominent Englishman on Long Island. And interesting to note at this time is that Lawrence and Cassandra Southwick, his former owners, relying on the charity of a Quaker benefactor on the island, moved to Long Island, impoverished and ill, only to see John Scott, the little boy they bought from their neighbor in better times, living high on the hog. Who knows what interactions the Southwicks and Scott had at this time, if they had any at all. Good feelings, bad feelings. Did Scott extend any charity onto them? What is known is that the Southwicks made out their individual wills and died soon afterward. But around the same time, back in merry old England, so had Oliver Cromwell, the Lord Protector of England, Scotland, and Ireland. Cromwell's son for a short time attempting to assume the same role. At the end of this debacle, the son of Charles I, creatively known to English history as Charles II, victoriously returns to England takes the crown and becomes king. This is known as the Restoration, whereas the Civil War had led to a period of parliamentary control and then this protectorate period, now in the Restoration, all of that would be swept away. And as we saw in our last episode, the men who signed the death warrant of King Charles I, the father of King Charles II, would now be chased to the ends of the earth, tortured and executed. And if you were lucky, given lifetime imprisonment, the flip side of this, is the old royalist families who had lost everything in defense of King Charles's father, they would now come beckoning to the court to receive royal favor, positions, titles, compensation, or plain old influence for everything they had lost in the cause. Enter John Scott, a lawyer on Long Island with this fantastical tale of a loyalist family brought to ruin in service of their king. If only he could make it back to England, so that he could tell this wonderful story. All the while with his hand out, back on mainland New England, wealthy Puritan merchants created what was known as the Atherton Company. It was a land grab scheme to take away land from Rhode Island and the Narragansett natives. John Scott convinced the Atherton Company to fund his voyage to England so that he could represent them in their land interests in the new royal court. In reality, different locales on Long Island knowing that each colony would have to receive a new charter, wanted John Scott to go to England to receive a separate charter for Long Island as its own individual colony and not part of New Haven or Connecticut. And in both the case of the Atherton Company in Long Island, he was a good choice. For one thing, he at least had the story that his father was a royalist. And John Scott, despite having lived in New England, was no Puritan. But even though he was on Long Island, he wasn't a Quaker either. And suddenly, with the Restoration, like the flipping of a switch, everything in his life that had been a disadvantage had now become an advantage. And so between the years 1660 and 1663, John Scott is known to have gone to England twice. However, his proposal that Long Island become its own colony was blocked by John Winthrop Jr., who of course was there, if you listen to our last episode, was there to receive a charter for the Connecticut colony and that charter would swallow up all of New Haven. And part of New Haven was on Long Island. 
And so John Winthrop Jr. scuttled the plans for an independent Long Island, at least for now. Also, it is known during the Restoration period that King Charles II, and then of course King James II after him, wanted to consolidate these colonies to be more in line with the governance of New France. Rather than have a bunch of scattered little independent entities, they preferred large unified colonies that could successfully defend themselves from native coalitions, the French to the north and the Spanish to the south, preferably ruled over by royally appointed governors. This was the dream of Sir Ferdinando Gorgias and his Council for New England, and hint hint, will come to fruition later in this podcast season. And after this first trip, he does not receive a charter for an independent Long Island. However, the historian Lillian T. Maurer notes that he at least returned home in a quasi-official role. He had some sort of golden medallion he claims to have received from the king. He claims the Council on Foreign Plantations tasked John Scott with warning Peter Stuyvesant and New Netherland to live at peace with the English on Long Island. And he also claims that he has been authorized to enforce the Navigation Acts and thusly could confiscate ships. Also, somewhere along the way, before he left Long Island for the first time, he styled himself as a captain. But upon his return, somehow he became a colonel. I think we're in a Tinkerbell situation here where you have to believe in it for it to be real. And if the people on Long Island want to remain independent from Connecticut, if they want their properties sold to them through Scott to remain legitimate, well, then they're going to have to believe in John Tinkerbell Scott. During his second trip to England, it is known that he pushed for the takeover of New Netherland. How influential he was in that respect, I don't know. Of course, the English will be taking over New Netherland, but they seem to have already had plans to do so. And during the second trip, there would be one of the more curious episodes of his life. Although the Scots of Kent Hall would later disown any connection to John Scott, John got really close to the wife of one Daniel Gotherson, whose maiden name was Dorothea Scott. And in the very least, she either knew who he was from his childhood, part of her family, or convinced her that he was part of her extended family. And he uses this alleged familial connection to sell her property on Long Island. John Scott claims that he owns a third of Long Island himself and sells Mrs. Gotherson thousands of non-existent, non-specified acres on Long Island. And her young son, supposedly John Scott's distant cousin, would then leave with Scott to go assume the property. Returning back to New England for a second time, he is now fabulously wealthy and he has the Gotherson boy in tow who will be following him around like a lost puppy. Before traveling back to Long Island, he meets with John Winthrop Jr. in Connecticut, and he is made commander of a force of Connecticut militiamen to be deployed to Long Island to secure those settlements under the new Connecticut Charter. But back on Long Island, the English there, of course, did not want to become part of Connecticut. They were afraid of the natives, and they were fearful of the Dutch. John Scott, with this perhaps less than legitimate royal commission, to enforce the Navigation Acts does not respond like an invasion force, does not compel these settlements to submit to Connecticut. Instead, he begins to himself act like an executive authority, and at least one powerful faction in the English settlements on Long Island began to follow him. This all occurring at the turn of the year 1663 into 64, Scott discovered that the Long Islanders had been resisting absorption by Connecticut and had actually formed their own combination. Much like the first settlements of Rhode Island or New Haven, the individual villages agreed to a compact or combination and created their own self-declared colony. And in January of 1664, these confederated English settlements on Long Island declared John Scott president. Yes, he has now become the president of Long Island. A position even he knew would be temporary, as he claims he was just holding Long Island for the Duke of York. It already being known that the English planned to invade New Netherland, and the Duke would receive it as a proprietary colony, if they were in fact successful. Now John Scott, in becoming the president, just holding the position for the Duke, not only got to retain his power over Long Island, but if he could demonstrate his usefulness in helping the Duke take over all of New Netherland, once Long Island became part of the Duke's colony of New York, he could again count on royal favor. 
and save the various groups on Long Island who didn't want to be part of the Puritan Connecticut colony, like the Quakers, from religious persecution. Once accepting the role as president, he resigned his Connecticut commission. John Winthrop Jr. was furious. Having tasked him with bringing Long Island to submit to the Connecticut Charter, Scott used his collective titles and perceived authority to do the exact opposite. Now, John Scott is president. He swore in local magistrates. He issued travel passes. He stopped Dutch ships. He was a true executive. He spends January of 1664 bombarding Peter Stuyvesant, governor of New Netherland, with letters. He went so far as to demand that Stuyvesant meet him in Brooklyn to discuss matters, and then ignoring the jurisdiction of the Dutch, believing the colony now possession of the Duke of York, begins his march to Brooklyn. All along the way, entering Dutch towns, raising the English flag, taking over blockhouses, giving speeches loudly in the town square. None of these speeches are terribly elegant, and no one is impressed with them necessarily. They probably weren't planned, and they made John Scott look a little crazy. But what they did demonstrate is that the great Peter Stuyvesant had no control over his domain any longer. That the new president of Long Island could simply walk to the heart of New Netherland unopposed. And the truth is, many of these towns that were within New Netherland's domain, including the western portion of Long Island, had many English people, English colonists, already living there. And even though they gave their allegiance to the Dutch, if it appeared like the English were on the cusp of a successful invasion, they very quickly turned sides. This would include one John Underhill, who we, we've mentioned in previous episodes, a captain during the Pequot War, and hired mercenary commander during Keefe's War. Today, some would call him a genocidal maniac. But he sides with John Scott, and with no resistance, he goes town to town, not exactly extracting the allegiance of the town folk, but nevertheless being able to trample through on his way to Brooklyn. And just to give you a little taste of his character, in one of these towns where he raised the English flag, a little Dutch boy refused to salute the new flag, to which John Scott slapped the child. Once he reached the designated meeting point, of course Stuyvesant wasn't there. He wouldn't lower himself or honor John Scott enough to follow an order to arrive at a certain location at a certain time. Stuyvesant was the governor after all. However, the local sheriff ran off and got a commissioner. This would be an official that would sit under the governor as part of his council. The commissioner arrives and asks to see some paperwork from Scott, something from the English government, anything to verify his many claims to power, even over some portion of the English realm, so that they would know that Scott was somebody they could make a treaty with, or an agreement with, or even have a negotiation. Now, at this point, it's recorded that he presents the Dutch with some sort of charter for all of Long Island, including the portion that is in the control of New Netherland, or at least was until John Scott decided to march through there. Now, we know he doesn't have a charter for all of Long Island, and so this is obviously fake. And whatever document he showed the Dutch, it was missing a signature. The king's signature, the signature of men from a committee of some sort, anything. Clearly, John Scott had a forged document that he didn't even show John Winthrop Jr. Because obviously John Winthrop would have known this was a forgery. Maybe he thought the Dutch could be fooled. Perplexed, the commissioner not knowing what to do, nevertheless escorted John Scott to see Governor Stuyvesant in New Amsterdam given that Scott sent the rest of his force away, which he did. Now, being escorted to New Amsterdam, John Scott continued to loudly proclaim to everyone who passed by that they were now in the domain of the Duke of York. The commissioner, having enough, loudly declared that this was the land of the States General, referring to the government of the Netherlands. To this, John Scott responded, I will stick my rapier in the guts of any man who proclaims the States here. And then John Scott managed to get a meeting with Governor Stuyvesant himself. Now, Stuyvesant was a smart man who managed to have his colony survive the first Anglo-Dutch War, greatly outnumbered by the English to the east. Stuyvesant took over New Sweden in one sweep and several times depopulated the English from the Delaware River from the many attempts of the New Haven colony to settle there. But now here we are in 1664 and he realizes that John Scott, without opposition, managed to make it incredibly deep into his colony. And then being informed of the Duke of York's plans, 
and the very real chance that John Scott was just the beginning of an English invasion, he actually negotiates a truce with John Scott, further legitimizing the man, allowing the towns on both sides of Long Island to trade freely with one another, agreeing to no hostilities between them until the English crown and the Dutch states general decided the fate of the island. This truce would only hold for a short while, but it would give John Scott recognition and confirmation of his authority by New Netherland that he indeed at least was an official of English Long Island. And John Scott returns home victorious. Now, despite these successes, John Winthrop Jr. of Connecticut insisted that English Long Island belonged to Connecticut. He considered John Scott a criminal, having subverted and used the post that was given to him in Connecticut to facilitate the absorption of Long Island, setting up a government without a royal charter and in defiance of Connecticut's charter, and encouraging the people of Long Island to refuse Connecticut officials and protest Connecticut tax collectors. This occurred specifically in the settlement of Southampton, where John Scott advised the people not to pay Connecticut taxes as the land belonged to the Duke of York. Things happened very quickly now. In early spring, John Winthrop Jr. issued an arrest warrant for John Scott. And before the end of March, he sends his own force of loyal Connecticut militiamen and allied natives to Long Island to capture John Scott. Looking to seize the snake by the head, this force arrived at John Scott's own estate, which he creatively called Scott's Hall. They enter his house and there's a standoff. Scott with a few supporters unwilling to submit to this new force. I have found two different stories of what happens next, both with the same result. The first one claims that the natives closed in and decided to seize John Scott and managed to successfully carry him away. Another story claims that a single large man simply went up to John Scott, picked him up, and simply walked back to the boats with him over his shoulders. Either way, the great president of Long Island, who marched through New Netherland and back, lost the perceived power of his position by being physically picked up and removed like a toddler from Long Island. During his imprisonment, John Winthrop Jr. negotiated his own truce with Peter Stuyvesant but could not quite get the English on Long Island under his control. They protested Scott's arrest and were concerned for the possibility of him being assassinated. But John Winthrop Jr. would do no such thing and make a martyr out of the man. His arrest was also surprisingly protested by the former New Haveners who were absorbed by Connecticut, such as Reverend John Davenport, former Governor William Leet, but also various individuals in the Massachusetts and Plymouth colony protested his arrest, seeing as he might actually have been an official of the royal court after all. Long Island might fall into the Duke of York's grant, and his only act of aggression was to march in the New Netherland. Former New Haven Governor Leet actually accused John Winthrop and his allies of poisoning John Scott because he fell ill while in prison. John Scott's wife, Deborah, wrote several letters to Winthrop. In one, she said, I shall not trouble you with much at this time, only concerning myself, who I am not well, and with child, and with... The daily rumors which I hear do so aggravate my sorrow that I fear it will bring me to an untimely end, for I think it is his life they are at. Smartly not willing to accuse Winthrop of planning Scott's assassination, she nonetheless made it aware to him of the rumors that could implicate him if something were to happen to Scott. In May of 1664, in a court in Hartford, John Scott is found guilty on 10 counts of sedition. His very pregnant wife went to visit him in jail, where using her pregnancy, she managed to hide a coil of rope under her clothes that she left with Scott. And then at some point overnight, he used it to escape through a third story window and isn't seen again in the colony of Connecticut. And despite John Winthrop Jr.'s investigations, he remained a ghost. And yet in the early fall of 1664, as the English Navy and English regulars arrive in New England, for the long-awaited invasion of New Netherland, colonial militias augment this official force from England. And as this wave of men rolled into New Netherland, John Scott appeared as a captain of a troop of voluntary cavalrymen from Long Island. John Winthrop Jr., who was also present, was shocked. But what could he do? And at least for the moment, they were all on the same side. And maybe even John Scott was an official appointed by the royal court or at least hired by the Duke of York, after all. 
he had too many questions, and this would not be the moment to get those answers. Furthermore, after his previous disappearance, he had gone to Long Island looking for John Scott, couldn't find him, removed all the magistrates of the independent Long Island colony, and had them sworn back in as Connecticut officials. But now with the takeover of New Netherland, it really did seem like the Duke of York intended to take the entire island into his new colony. Was this all for nothing? And after Stuyvesant had surrendered the fort on Manhattan Island, and New Netherland had indeed become New York, John Scott had become an official of the new New York governor, Governor Nichols, and helped the governor reorganize Long Island as a New York possession. And so for a brief moment, it appears that John Scott had won, that somehow even his probable fictions had come true, and he had been president of Long Island. As promised, he ushered in the Duke of York's colony, and Long Island would not be part of Connecticut. A complete loss for John Winthrop Jr. However, the chickens are coming home to roost. John Scott began to push against Governor Nichols on issues related to property rights, civil liberties, and suffrage on Long Island. John Scott, with the same blowhard tendencies he showed on his first march through New Netherland, earned himself an arrest warrant from the governor of New York. Remember, he is also wanted in Connecticut for evading his imprisonment. And then the third thing that really put the nail in the coffin for Scott, Dorothea Gotherson, maiden name Scott, arrives in New England looking for her son, the aforementioned Gotherson boy, who, as it turns out, followed John Scott upon his arrest on Long Island to Connecticut. And over the intervening year or so, without any support or direction, found himself an indentured servant in the village of New Haven. Dorothea Gotherson saved her son, bought out his contract, and then sought some compensation from a New York court for all these baseless land claims that she had purchased from Scott for large tracts of unidentified land on Long Island. This time, the heat proved too much. And before either of the three parties could get to him, he had escaped Long Island and taken up a new position in faraway Barbados. Most everything he owned on the island would be sold away to compensate all injured parties. His wife and children abandoned and now impoverished. He never would come back for them. Governor Nichols wrote to the Duke of York that John Scott was born to work mischief. After this, Scott finally got to go on the many adventures he dreamed of as a child, finding occupations as a soldier, a sailor, a pirate, a privateer, and a spy. And towards the end of his life, made a little cash selling books about his adventures. And that's where many of the details of his earlier life are found. Now knowing his character, you as the listener can evaluate how truthful those stories might be. How tall his tales measure. Of his life after Long Island, the historian Charles Andrews says, At one time or another, he seems to have made trouble in nearly every part of the British world. But perhaps now we can assign some legacy to him. Much as we learned in our last episode, the New Haven colony, as it was absorbed by Connecticut, also fell within the Duke of York's grant. But the people there, by allowing Connecticut to absorb it under its royal charter, were able to successfully exclude themselves from becoming part of New York. Now, the New Haven settlements on Long Island, as we have learned, did not want to be part of this absorption into Connecticut. And if we are to be generous with the legacy of John Scott, it appears that he was a major organizing force into making sure that, unlike mainland New Haven, Long Island would not come into possession of the new chartered Connecticut colony and their Puritan hegemony. Instead, it would be part of New York. And to this day, I don't need to tell you, Long Island is part of New York State, the successor to the colony of New York. But one place that is no longer part of New York is New Jersey, of course. It's its own state. But remember, it was part of the original Duke of York's grant for New York. The Duke would section off the lower chunk of what used to be New Netherland and give it to his wealthy friends and creditors, who we'll learn about in a very future episode. Now, Governor Nichols of New York resented the shrinking of his domain. And in 1666, the governor records that he suspected John Scott of convincing the Duke of York to give New Jersey to his friends Carteret and Berkeley. So being ambitious with our appraisal of John Scott, we have the shape of New York, the shape of New Jersey, and the shape of Connecticut to this day at least partially influenced by this one man. 
quite a legacy for a short-lived president of Long Island. Also, something to think about before we end this episode. John Scott, if every single thing he said about his background, about his different titles and medals and positions he supposedly has, if all of that was 100% fiction, how is it that he seems to have access to the Duke of York? Even the governors seem to acknowledge that. How is it that he seems to have access to the legitimate Scott family of Kent? These are things to think about, contemplate, but have no certain answer. Uh, but again, perhaps I'm being too kind to John Scott. I'm going to end this episode with a quote from the historian Wilbur C. Abbott concerning Mr. Scott. To be a rascal is bad. To be a great rascal is doubtless worse. But to be embalmed in biographical dictionaries for pure rascality, not even made respectable by success, of all the failures in this conflict between man and oblivion, this is perhaps the worst. <laughs>